almost always works. And if it doesn't, it's always being recorded. So, Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Lohm. He is a cardiologist, and he has an amazing story just about his own transformation when he first learned about a plant-based diet. Please welcome him to the show. It's very nice to have you back, even though you didn't have your own episode, but you were there with your lovely daughter. But I want to know about you today. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be on here. Thank, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I was talking right before we went on that in the photo that you, Forks Over Nice did a wonderful story about you. And the before and after was just astounding. I mean, it's amazing. You lost almost 100 pounds. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing how much better you feel. And then when you, you know, when you learn the truth about nutrition and how powerful it could be, how good you could feel, you just keep going. And then before you know it, you're like, my gosh, I can't believe that I actually got to that weight before, how, how was I getting around? How was I feeling? And it's just so hard to think back to those days. And um, wow, so I understand it actually is really good as a physician. It gives me kind of the empathy. I can understand where my patients are standing because I've been through and suffered through the standard American diet. I've been through the struggles of trying to lose the weight and I and fortunately been successful. So it allows me to connect a lot better with, with people who are in the same scenario, which is unfortunately a lot of people. You know, and I think Dr. Loma is when people gain weight, it's slowly over time. Nobody wakes up a hundred pounds heavy overnight. And I think if they did, they would really do something about it, but it's so slow. It's like the frog in boiling water that, you know, you, you, you just don't notice. Sometimes I think you get used yeah, to it. it. It's one of the funny things that uh, sometimes I'll tell or ask my patients, I'll be like, what did you weigh in high school when you graduated high school? That's usually the good benchmark because most people when they graduate high school back back in the day were nice and thin. And they're like, well, you know what? I guess I weighed like 160 pounds back in high school and I'm 220 now. Huh, you're right. You know, I felt great when I was in high school. I'm like, well, shoot for that again, you know? Did, did your colleagues notice when you lost your weight, how long did it take you? Because I, I have a friend who's a vegan doctor in Los, at Los Angeles and they call him the crazy vegan doctor because he's a, a normal weight now. And it's like, oh, you, you must have cancer. Like, did they notice your transformation and comment on it? Yeah, yeah. I started losing weight around 2014 and I did a lot of it the wrong way, which we'll get into, but um, it took me a total of maybe two or three years. And yeah, actually um, a lot of people, as I got into lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition, uh, I gave you know presentations here and there to many other doctor groups. And there was a number of doctors that you know, changed their diet to mostly plant-based. And even one cardiologist went hundred percent plant-based with his wife and all his kids and everything. And so, you know, I think that Logical people, when they hear the truth and they read the science, they, they get it. So, yeah. Yeah. So was, was seeing forks over knives, was that your turning point? That was it. That was it for sure. Yeah. It was um, kind of a, a random Netflix suggestion. Uh, it was, it was weird because I, I had heard a little bit about a plant-based diet because I was trying to exercise a lot. Uh, to lose weight because I thought that's what you had to do, right? <laughs> and uh, not, not you know, necessarily change your diet. And um, so I heard about it because a YouTube channel I was following at that time, the guy, the marathon runner who was giving tips on, on running uh, was following a whole food plant-based diet. I'm like, ah, what's that? I've never heard of that. That sounds weird. So I just kind of blew it off. But then um, I don't know, you know, how your phones like magically listen to you and hear things that are going on. Somehow Netflix just said, you should watch Forks Over Knives. And I'm like, what is that? And then I, you know, watched it and that was a life changer for me, no question. You know, I, I hear that from so many doctors, especially cardiology, where it, where reversal is possible and prevention is possible. And I love the quote by Dr. Ken Williams, there are two kinds of cardiologists, vegan and those who haven't read the data. So what do you think is the resistance to ones that maybe have read the data and don't agree or, or won't read the data? Because you can still make a living. So I thought long and hard about this question, because when I first watched Forks Over Knives, I'm like, no, oh, this can't be legitimate. There's no way this is real. This is all just kind of you know, propaganda stuff, whatever. And uh, when I read the science and realized, no, no, this is legitimate stuff. I was mad. I was angry that this wasn't the focus of my medical training. I mean, training the cause of the illness, just this like common sense that you should be doing this. Right. And so I, I thought long and hard, why the heck is it that I wasn't trained in this? And I came up with a number of different reasons uh, and it's likely a combination of, of things, but uh, part of it is honestly, I think one of the main part is, is culture and the other part is money. Uh, but the culture is, you know, like the cardiologists that trained me, both of them were nearly 300 pounds in diabetics themselves. 
I remember on rounds in the ward and what a great, I mean, he's a great doctor, caring, compassionate person, very smart person, but he didn't really know much about non-heart related things. And I remember we had a complicated diabetic patient and the residents were asking the head cardiologist, oh, we don't know what to do with these diabetic medicines. And he goes, come on guys, the only thing I know about diabetes is I have it. I mean, look at me. That's all I know. So uh, why'd you call endocrine and figure it out? Like, oh my gosh. Now at the time, you know, we all laughed about it. Now I think of, think of that comment and I'm like, wow, that's, that was kind of the culture that even though you're a doctor and you knew that, you know, you should be losing weight, eating healthy people just didn't do it. And then, yeah, you can certainly make money uh, in regards to, you know, being a doctor, but focusing on that with your patients is hard. It takes a long time. The reimbursement is very low. The lowest paid doctor in America is a preventative medicine specialist. And, uh, you know, the highest paid is a plastic surgeon. So it's just the way our system is set up. So if we're not incentivized to really achieve lifestyle medicine uh, targets, we're just not going to go at it. And so that's just an unfortunate reality of the way our healthcare system is set up. And there's lots of other things too, all the marketing and and, you know, stuff that we get, that we get pushed pills. You know, when I was a medical student, I uh, was taken out to multiple steak dinners for free by the drug companies. And it was always like, here's this drug for high blood pressure. Here's that drug for high blood pressure. Why don't you prescribe our drug, prescribe our drug, whatever. And it was never, it just completely made you think, oh, the answer to hypertension, the medicines, right? Because that's all we focus on is medicines. Oh, is it it is not food. So of- it was really, you know, just drilled in our head. And so there's just so many different reasons. And, um, And I'm very lucky, I feel, that my path took me the way that it did to kind of take those blinders off and and open my mind, because I feel like it helps me be be, uh, a much better doctor to the patients to understand where they're at and focus more on the lifestyle. Are the patients coming to see you particularly because they are interested in changing their diet and lifestyle, or do they just show up and then you kind of spring it on them? Yeah, (laughs) it's um, when I was in Chicago working at Rush, working with Kim Williams for a while, um, there wasn't that many cardiologists that practiced the lifestyle medicine approach. So a lot of people came to me for that reason. But now that I'm out in Monterey, California, uh, it's not as, as populated. Um, I'm able to do, I'm working on some good lifestyle medicine programs here, but most of the people it's, it's like deer in the headlights. Uh, I start talking to them about it and I, you know, they're like, why is this doctor making the main focus of the visit diet, exercise, and losing weight? What about all my pills? What about all the tests and stuff like that? I'm like, no, 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 no. You, and I have to, you know, really drill in their mind. But, you know, one of the other reasons doctors don't really practice this that much is some of these patients, especially the ones that weren't expecting it, that aren't seeking out a lifestyle medicine approach, you could spend an hour or more talking to them about this, showing them food, showing them recipes, asking them what they eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, educating them about nutrition. They'll come back a couple months later and they gain weight and they had made zero changes. And that it gets frustrating for, for doctors. And I think that's one of the reasons why doctors don't put in that effort that often is because of our cultural barriers and um, marketing and our food system and all these other things that it's harder for patients to, to achieve what we want them to without the support that they need. Some people can't, obviously they're highly motivated, but a lot of, a lot of them can't. And so taking all that time, an hour with the patient and not getting reimbursed for it, and then they don't make any change is, is frustrating. And I remember First, I'm going to tell all my patients about this. This is all I'm going to talk about. And I'm like, everybody's going to lose weight. And I'm going to be like the doctor that makes all their patients healthy. It was maybe, maybe one out of 10 patients really listen and make dramatic changes. And that, that's frustrating. So it must be very frustrating, especially when you know there's something that can be done about it. And, you know, people worry about breast cancer. I'm not saying people shouldn't and COVID, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, but cardiovascular disease is the true pandemic. And people aren't seem that concerned about it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it certainly is true. And I have some slides that I could show you too that shows, has some of those statistics and just to kind of put it in percep- per, per perspective, it's, um, it should be the focus of all of America's health. And, you know, taking a lifestyle medicine approach to help prevent, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure and heart disease, it would also have made the COVID pandemic almost nothing. Because the reason COVID hit us so hard is because we're so sick as a country. That's why so many people die. And if we just didn't have these chronic diseases, really COVID-19 wouldn't have been as big of a deal. It still would have you know, had some impact, but nowhere near on the scale that it already had. And so myself and a bunch of other physicians um, with the Physicians Committee Responsible Medicine and such, we sent letters to a bunch of different politicians and governors in our local area saying, hey, 
it's great for COVID-19 that you should wash hands and socially distance and mask up and everything. But hey, you also need to tell people to eat healthy, stay active, lose weight, control their chronic diseases, because that's going to help them survive COVID if they get it. And as I never received any response from the multiple different politicians that I wrote letters to. And it's, it's frustrating, you know, we, so we really should have taken a different approach. And that's just another, another thing that supports, you know, lifestyle medicine and but it's lost. It's lost in the mix of everything else. I mean, like Bill Clinton was a great example, uh, but you know, he's kind of forgotten about a little bit. I mean, I don't mean in terms of being president, but in terms of what he did adopting yeah. his diet. And yeah, that, he had that, bypass, he had bypass surgery 2004. It was around 2010 that one of his bypasses uh, failed and he had a heart attack in stent place. Then he got in line with Dr. Dean Ornish, who I'm a huge fan of. Uh, and Dr. Dean Ornish helped him quite a bit, change his diet. And so Bill Clinton's been, uh, I believe he's like 98, 99% plant-based. I heard um, a little fish sneaks in every week or two or something, but uh, he's, you know, great transformation. And now it's been 11 years since his heart attack after his bypass surgery failed. No other heart issues. So, I mean, that's shows you how, how powerful it can be. Why isn't that in the news more? You know, it's interesting because I, I have a photo on the wall. My grandfather graduated medical school in the early 1900s. There were women in his class, by the way, yet they still wow. call them fellows. But there were no cardiologists back then. That yeah, wasn't a long special. time ago. The field of cardiology, I don't know exactly when it started, like 1950s or 60s or so is when it kind of first started. But even still, in my current practice, there's some people who practice cardiology who never went through formal training because they just kind of, they were the doctor in town that said, I'm going to do the cardiology and they kind of self-train themselves. And so that's, it is, um, it is a relatively newer thing because now we have more interventions and techniques that we can do, but uh, it's still been true, you know, 50, hundred years ago, just like today, the cause of heart disease is diet and lifestyle related. It should have been the focus, but that realization honestly didn't start happening until like the 50s, 60s, uh, when um, more of the nutritional data started coming out showing, and you know, with smoking cigarettes and everything, about how impactful lifestyle was on heart disease. Yeah, it's, if they didn't have these procedures and medications, people might actually have to take some actions and personal responsibility. Yeah. No question about it. It's, uh, it's really weird. I, I've had a, a number of patients, you know, a lot of people when they have a heart attack or something, they make some big dramatic changes, but I've had a number of patients that are like 50 years old, big heart attack, widow maker, gets their stent. And it seems so easy because they come in one day, they get their procedure, they stay one night, they go home the next day. Oh like, yeah, yeah, I had my heart attack. I survived. All right. I survived my heart attack. Now I can go ahead and keep doing whatever, you know, I was doing before, because I know uh, you know, I already survived the heart attack because one out of three people, their first symptom of heart disease is they just die, sudden death. And so if you're not that one person, it, you know, some people are like, hey, all right, it's a ticket for me to just go ahead and keep doing what I want. I've got my cholesterol medicines, my aspirin, and, uh, and that's it. So some people actually have that attitude and it's really wrong, but most people do make some changes. Unfortunately, they, number one, don't make enough changes to go on a uh, mostly or completely plant-based diet. Number two, a lot of times I make changes and they won't maintain it for any more than a few months. I remember when I was 11 years old, that would have been 1971, I lived with my uncle who was an internal medicine doctor in, at St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank. And at the time he was the president of the American Heart Association, the chapter there. And we went yeah. to some dinner where he got an award and like they served like greasy chicken and, and the American Heart Association diet, I mean, I'm sure it's better than the standard American diet, but it doesn't really seem like it's all that healthy for disease prevention and disease reversal. Absolutely. So two things in regards to that. So number one, when I was in training, yeah, our journal club, we were served pizza, pepperoni pizza and soda pop and potato chips. Uh, and the analogy to that, number two, is um, it's a very similar thing to tobacco and smoking. Doctors used to smoke cigarettes in hospitals, in hospitals. And they used to serve cigarettes in hospitals, right? I even had a patient who was at Cleveland Clinic who showed me the burn wound on his arm from where the doctor, the cardiologist dropped the cigarette on his arm and burned him in the middle of surgery. So the cardiologist was actually smoking during the procedure. This was in the early 1970s even. And, uh, and so it used to be all over the place. Doctors smoked, it was everywhere. So now the perfect analogy is food. Everywhere in the hospital you go, there's still sugary drinks, candy bars in the vending machines. And I remember I got in a little bit of trouble when I was leaving one of my jobs about three or four years ago. I was already on my way out moving to Rush and I got this email, hey, we're having our annual fundraiser for the foundation. Everybody come to the lobby and buy their bunt cakes. 
And I'm thinking, oh, really? That's what we're selling to our employees for fundraising? It's white flour. It's, you know, heavy cream. It's, it's um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sugar in there. And that's what we're doing. We're essentially feeding our employees something that's going to be causing all these diseases. And so this email went out to thousands of employees. And I didn't think this was going to work. But I hit the reply all button. And it worked. And all I said was, healthcare systems should not support the sale of foods that promote the diseases that we're supposed to prevent. And that's all I said. And I actually got phone calls from three hospital CEOs and a bunch of emails all in complete support. It was awesome. And as far as I know, that fun cake sale is no longer happening. So <laughs> that is, that's great. I'll never forget. Well, first of all, that cigarette story is hilarious. And I remember in the twenties, not in the twenties, in the eighties, when I was 20, I was a respiratory therapist and I'll never forget the head of our pulmonary department smoked. And I'm like, that is so bizarre to me because, you know, knowing what, you know, but I remember when I was in my forties, a, a friend of mine ended up in the ER, he had chest pain. And he, while we, we were visiting him and they were waiting, they did run a bunch of tests and they had concluded he either had a heart attack or he was diabetic and they fed him dinner. I'll never forget. It was beef stew it was apple pie and milk. And I'm like, how do you give that to somebody when you're telling them they're either diabetic or just had a heart attack? Yeah, it's a complicated, uh, complicated issue. Uh, through Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine with Neil Barnard, we've worked on a lot of different initiatives to try to improve hospital food. The first simple thing is try to get fast food out of hospitals because there are still hospitals with Burger King, uh, oh Wendy's, God. McDonald's. We've essentially gotten rid of that for the most, I think there's one or two that are a handful that, that are still left. But um, the other thing is um, in New York, California, have actually passed laws stating that hospital menus should have plant-based options on them. The ACC, American College of Cardiology, has a policy that says not only should plant-based options be on the hospital menu, but they should be front and center and promoted to heart disease patients actively. And the American Medical Association, which we've worked together with to try to help change their policies, has a, a, a very similar policy. But these are just policies. The hospitals have to act on them. And so each local hospital really needs a physician advocate there to go up to the administration, go up to the head nutrition person, say, we got to get a healthy plant-based menu option. You know, one of the great things that we did in my prior places, we got forks over knives up on the TV. So I could be like, hey, you need to order these things on the menu. Here are the five plant-based entrees. And I'm turning on forks over knives for you to check out right now. Please watch it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. You know, so it was a great, perfect time. You had the patient stuck there in the hospital. Let's educate you. Let's get you going. Taste the food while you're at it. And they had this whole email I send my patients with other recipe websites, videos you could watch and local places that, you know, that they can get healthy food from and such. And it, it works better uh, that way, but it, you know, still, still a challenge, but uh, the, mo the more you can do, obviously, the more successful you're going to be to help, help people uh, change your diet and do the right thing. Yeah. When I was a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania in 1977, I was visiting my roommate's sister who was at Children's Hospital and guess what? establishment was in the lobby mcdonald's ah see because that way they crazy. can give you the disease in the lobby and then treat you in the hospital and then they feel so guilty they have those ronald mcdonald houses where you can stay for free once yes. your kid has cancer which they gave your kid probably you're pro you're exactly right isn't that really crazy it's uh it actually makes me mad. <laughs> it shouldn't be mad. I, what makes me mad is that other people don't care. You know, that's that's what really makes me mad. And, and, I understand uh, the business of the companies is to do business, but the people just don't seem to care. Yeah, a part of it, I, I hope it's ignorance uh, to some degree. They just don't know and just don't quite get the, the huge impact that your diet and this type of food has on cancer and stuff. But I know a lot of people do know, obviously. And yeah, but they just don't want to give up their burgers and fries and milkshakes and such. And but I have burgers and fries and milkshakes. I, seriously, like I, I make the best sweet potato burgers with the best date shakes and the best air fries. I mean, my food is so good. I don't get it. I have burger shakes and fries every week. And this is one of the things that I wish, what I'm sad about is that our healthcare system hasn't done more to make it easy to eat healthy and our food system, our government policies haven't done more because if we made it convenient and easy. We had fast food joints that served your sweet potato burgers and your oil-free, you know, fries and such. Then I, th I think more and more people certainly would do it, but there's like no support out there. It's almost nothing. And that makes it all the burdens on the individual person. And then they go home and their family's not eating healthy. They're being marketed to, then they have a party to go to. It just really makes it hard. It has to be a complete cultural shift, a food system shift and a healthcare system shift. And it's just, 
I agree. Wow. If healthy eating was as easy as unhealthy eating, more people would do it. It's that conservation of energy principle. It's not exactly that it's more right. expensive. It's just that you, where are you going to find it? You no know? question. No yeah. question about it. Well, would you so, want to share? You know, we have some questions, but if, you, if you'd like, you could share your slides now. What yeah, yeah, yeah. We can go through the slides. And uh, yeah, we can interrupt any time for questions. I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, so should we share the screen then? Yeah, absolutely. I believe I clicked the correct button All that you right. should be able to do it on your own. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Here's the go. button that says share screen. Yep. There now I can see it. it. All right. And then so you want to just change the view so that we're not seeing the side. Okay. Um, that's it. That's it. That's it. You got it. All right. Yep. Great, great, great. So, um, that, that was me before I lost the weight. And that's my daughter, Jaden. Uh, she uh, has a YouTube channel, Jaden's Vegan Culinary Creation. She was on your show just recently. And that's when I was about 100 pounds heavier. That was like seven years ago now. And um, yeah, I grew up, you know, what's really interesting, I think there's a, a lot of doctors on plant-based diets. A lot of people have lost a lot of weight. And, uh, and it, what, what's very nice when doctors go through this transformation, I think, is because we really do get it from two angles, from a personal perspective. I, my health was falling apart. I was, you know, gaining weight, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, horrible acid reflux. My back was killing me. I couldn't keep up with my, with my children. I have six hundred percent plant-based children. And, um, and it was, it was, my health was falling apart, but at the same time, I was frustrated that all I was doing was pushing pills on patients. And even though I gave them all the right medicines, they would still have heart attacks and strokes and need bypasses. I knew something was wrong. And, uh, when I tried to recapture my health, I made the same mistake so many people did, focusing on exercise. First thing I did, 100 pounds overweight, is I signed up for a marathon. It's like, I see all those runners, you think they're all so light. That must be the solution, right? Just exercise like crazy. And I still ate all this junk food here. I ate all the horrible stuff. I just told myself, moderation, I'm just going to cut back. I mean, eat fewer donuts, fewer cookies, less soda, go to McDonald's less often. And I tell my patients all the time, moderation is not the right answer. Moderation doesn't work just like you shouldn't do heroin and cocaine in moderation. Uh, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes in moderation. Bad things for you should really be zero. And it took me a long time to learn that. And so forks over knives, like we talked about, is what really changed my life. And, and um, I lost nearly 100 pounds and it just turned me into a, a different doctor and a different person. So I'm so thankful for forks over knives. And I'm so thankful that it not only helped me personally get my health back in order, but now professionally, I, I feel like I do much better service. So when, when I do little presentations and talk to the community, which I try to do as much as I can, I usually go through these four things. I talk about how horrible our healthcare system is. And I put that in quotes because it's not really a healthcare system, right? Because the definition of the word health is the state of being free from illness, but we don't really do that. We just maintain illness in our current system talk about heart disease, do a little crash course on nutrition, which I don't need to preach to the choir here because a lot of people watching your show already know a lot about what we should be doing and being whole food plant-based. And I give people some tips as to what we can do. So let me just fly through some of these things here and then we should have lots of time to go through some questions. So uh, heart disease is the number one cause of death in America for more than hundred consecutive years since 1919. The last time heart disease wasn't the number one killer was 1918, which was the Spanish flu. Even last year, COVID was number three, cancer has been number two. And when you look at the perspective, heart disease and stroke is huge. It towers over things like war, pregnancy and birth complications, murder and suicide. This is the true pandemic, like you were saying, Chef Adrian. This is what we really need to be focusing on because it's nearly 100% preventable. We have a cure for heart disease sitting in front of our face, but we have actively chosen to ignore it. Why? It, because of culture and money. And it's not just heart disease. It's, uh, of course, a lot of other things, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, dementia, as you guys know, so many different diseases. They say 80% of healthcare spending or more is for diseases that are preventable related to diet and lifestyle. And so it's culture and it's money. Our culture is into the unhealthy food and money talks in America. That's just the way it is. Our food system is multi-trillion dollar. Healthcare system is multi-trillion dollar. And the government policies about food are really not proper to support subsidizing the healthy foods. We should be giving apples away for free. An apple a day keeps a doctor away. Beans, beans, good for your heart. I know they're cheap already, but they should be free. We should be giving them to everybody. And that would save on healthcare because really we spend too much. When we think about healthcare and money, well, you know, we live in a capitalistic society. You went back a hundred years and said, let's make a healthcare system based on making money. In the upper left corner, you got the healthy person. You don't want that person. You can't make money off of them. 
in the upper right corner there, you don't want people to be dead, right? You don't want dead people either because you can't make money off of them. And so what happens in the bottom middle there is we keep people alive, kind of, on multiple medicines, needing to see their doctors all the time, needing surgeries, tests, and procedures. Maybe they live longer. We could add years to the life, but we don't add life to their years. So they don't add good quality of life because we're just maintaining these diseases, giving them more and more pills, surgeries. And unfortunately, too many people are in nursing homes and not functionally active when they get to be older. That's the way our system is naturally set up. And it, a lot of it's driven by, by money because healthy people don't make money, dead people don't make money. Let's just maintain the chronic diseases, add more tests, surgeries, and procedures. And that's just the way it is. And so as a percentage of our economy, the United States towers over every other country. More than 20% now of our economy is healthcare spending. When you look at all these other countries, why do we spend so much? Well, we must be healthy, right? Because we spend so much money on healthcare. Actually, according to the World Health Organization, we're dead last, lowest life expectancy of all industrialized nations, despite all that money that we spend. As you know, it's just so backwards. So, you know, I go through this whole thing about why it's not always the individual person's fault that they're unhealthy. Yes, everybody should take some personal responsibility. And you really need to you know, work hard because it's this culture doesn't support us being healthy. But when I think back to like, how is it that I got to my point in my life? How did my sister become 450 pounds in high school? Both my parents hit 300 pounds. We grew up, these are the five things I always think about as to why America is so unhealthy. Our human instincts, which um, Doug Vial um, talks a lot about, the pleasure trap, you know, sugar, salt, and fat, uh, seek pleasure, avoid pain, conserve energy. That's not the individual person's fault. That's a mechanism. We have to consciously be able to control all those cravings. And it's so hard when problem number two, our culture is just feeding you unhealthy food in your face. I grew up with all this processed food and sugar. Halloween candy was breakfast, lunch, and dinner for me for a week after every Halloween. And it, it was just the way I grew up. So of course I became a food addict. And uh, that's just the way it is. Was that my fault that that was the culture I, I grew into? Not really. The food industry is the third problem where they just market to us and they don't care about your health, all these commercials, and they add sugar, salt, and fat and process things, remove the fiber from the, the food. That wasn't, that's not an individual person's fault. And our government policies, like we talked about, not the individual person's fault. And our healthcare system doesn't focus on eating healthy and prevention. So all these things really isn't the individual person's fault. And so what I try to do by talking about these things is to open people's eyes, take their blinders off to say, look, I know you got to this point in your life, you're 40 years old, you're 300 pounds, you're diabetic, you just had a heart attack. And I'm sorry this happened to you. Yes, you know, you should have kind of been eating healthier and lose weight, but it's not completely all your fault because of this mess up in our whole system. But once you realize this, once you see this and understand how crazy important lifestyle changes are, now it will be your fault if you don't act upon it. Your blinders are off. You need to educate yourself, empower yourself, and learn the right things to do, change those habits, lose the weight. And so my goal is always to try to take those blinders off and empower people. And so what we really want to do is shift our acute care model of our healthcare system from short, short appointments, doctor visits only, getting paid for how many patients that we see, not getting paid for prevention. We want to get paid for an integrative provo uh, approach, preventing disease, paradigm shift away from pills and to plants. That's really what we should be doing. And it's really so many barriers is so challenging. It's getting there, but it's getting there extremely slowly, way too slow. What, what I like to talk to people about is um, the life, what lifestyle medicine, the concepts of lifestyle medicine. And I think this is a great analogy. I never advocate animal experimentation, of course, because um, I am vegan for health and for the animals too. But uh, the, what, the great analogy about uh, lifestyle medicine is the monkey and the rabbit, you know, they're born with clean arteries. Their diet is plant-based in nature. They don't clog their arteries. They don't build cholesterol plaque, but animal experimentation in the past, which again, I don't advocate, but they basically take these animals, they bring them in the labs and they feed them diets high in cholesterol and saturated fat within six months to a year can severely clog their arteries. But what's magical is if they take those animals that they just induced clogging of their arteries and cholesterol plaque buildup, and they put them back in the nature, give them back their carrots and their bananas and let them be physically active. Guess what happens? The disease reverses itself. And so 
I like to tell patients that what lifestyle medicine is about is restoring the human body to its default state of health. The default state of the human body is to be healthy. We only become unhealthy if we actively do something to damage our bodies, mostly with the food we eat, but also smoking cigarettes and alcohol use, stressing yourself out, not sleeping good, not staying physically active. So the most important thing is remove the thing that's causing the harm and the body will heal itself. Just like if you cut your hand with a knife and you do nothing, you can stop the bleeding, you can form a scab and scar it over. But if you keep cutting yourself in the same place over and over again, you never heal up. So that's the lifestyle medicine concept. And what's so important about heart disease to know is when you're born, your arteries are clean. This is a three-year-old in childhood, cholesterol plaque builds up 18 years old and in adulthood is what can happen to you. And then if one of these little plaques, you may not have any symptom from a blockage like this, but if it clots on you, that triggers a heart attack. And the first symptom in one out of three people, about a third of people is they just die. Uh, sudden death. And so being doing prevention early on is so crazy important. And so the key to heart disease prevention and reversal, really, there's other nuances and other things we could talk about, but TMAO and other stuff. Uh, but really, it is lowering your cholesterol numbers and protecting your endothelium from damage. So uh, there is a really great studied article uh, by Dr. William Roberts here, who basically showed and anal analyzed all the data, and this is uh, pretty well accepted, that the only major risk factor for developing heart disease and stroke and clogging your arteries is having an elevated LDL cholesterol. In other words, if your LDL cholesterol is low, there is no evidence that anything else like smoking cigarettes, high blood pressure, diabetes, inactivity, or obesity will clog your arteries. So the prerequisite to develop heart disease is that LDL being high, and we'll talk about why a plant-based diet, of course, is ideal for it. And that's because your cholesterol goes up eating cholesterol, eating saturated fats, and eating trans fats. Cholesterol, as you know, only comes from animal-based foods. 90% of saturated fat comes from animal-based foods. And essentially, most of you know, the trans fats come from animal-based foods. So that's why a plant-based diet wins. And um, this is a powerful study, a powerful graph to show how important it is that the average American's LDL cholesterol is 125. And if you're the average American by the age of 40, then on the right side is your risk of heart attack. The average American with LDL cholesterol of 125 has a 1% risk of heart attack at the age of 40, 4% at the age of 60, and 16% at the age of 80. Now, a lot of patients I come in and see, they have LDL sitting around 160. And at that level, you're at about a 3% by the age of 40, 16% by the age of 80, and you're off the charts by the, you know, 16% by the age of 60, off the charts by the age of 80. So if we can get that LDL down, the average vegan's LDL is around 68. So if you can get the LDL to around 60 or so, then by the age of 40, you're way under 1% risk of heart attack. By the age of 60, you're still under 1% risk. And by the age of 80, you're still under 1% risk of heart attack. So that's just based on LDL cholesterol and nothing else, not even talking about smoking or exercising or weight, just your LDL. So it's so important to get that number down. Normal levels are probably around 30 to 70. That's where babies are and adult primates, monkeys out in nature between 40 and 80 for your LDL cholesterol. So we really wanna keep it as low as we can. And there's a couple things that the USDA dietary guidelines do get right. But then they contradict themselves. And this is kind of crazy. Uh, they say that the Institute of Medicine, which is now called the National Academy of Medicine, individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible. Well, guess what that means? In my mind, that means zero, right? As little as possible, zero. But then they say, ah, you can still have between 100 and 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day. <sighs> Come on, you know, it, we don't need to eat cholesterol to live. It's not an essential nutrient, should be none. Now, maybe more important is the saturated fats in regards to heart disease risk. And they have a comment on that too. They say that the Institute of Medicine did not set an upper limit for how much trans fats, saturated fats, and cholesterol that you should eat because any amount that you eat, any amount will increase your LDL cholesterol numbers, any amount. So we shouldn't eat any. So I have my patients get their cholesterol profiles checked every month at least, make different dietary changes. And I keep telling them reduce the, the cholesterol and the saturated fat, eat less animal products, less oils, uh, and that's, that's the key. And it's just like cigarettes. You don't need to smoke cigarettes to live. You don't need to eat cholesterol saturated fat to live. So ideally it would be zero, right? That's what we really should be doing. So <clears throat> that's the LDL thing. And then protecting the endothelium is, a, is the second thing to prevent heart disease. The endothelium is the lining of the arteries right here, all these cells that line the arteries. 
plaque can build up as the endothelium becomes inflamed and damaged if your cholesterol numbers are high. And what I like to think of it, we know that atherosclerosis, clogging of arteries is inflammation. I like to think of it inflammation. What does that word mean? Flame, right? So you think of it as like being on fire. So your artery is on fire, it's inflamed. And so you don't wanna do anything that pours gas on that flame. You don't wanna fuel the inflammation. Animal products can cause inflammation. Oils essentially of any kind, yeah, some are less harmful oils, but in general, they're all not good for you. Refined carbohydrates, saturated fat, smoking cigarettes, even secondhand smoke causes inflammation and damages the endothelium. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna pour fuel on the flame. We wanna pour water on the flame. What is that, of course? fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, herbs, spices. Uh, we'd really want to focus on the whole unprocessed plant-based foods that can help the antioxidants and knock out the inflammation with the healthy uh, omega-3 fatty acids and such. So the concept of lifestyle medicine, again, is remove the thing that's causing the harm. So look at this analogy, just remove all that. You're not pouring gas on the flame anymore. You're only pouring water on the flame and what's gonna happen, you're gonna put out the fire. So that's the perfect analogy, just remove the thing that's causing the harm. And by default, you're only left with healthy things that won't damage you, fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts and seeds are, you know, depending on who you listen to with Dean Ornish and Esselstyn, they want nuts and seeds out. Those are for critically, you know, horrible coronary disease patients. That's more important, but that's the concept of lifestyle medicine. Lower your cholesterol numbers, knock out that inflammation, and that's key. But what do Americans eat? 12% of America's diet is unprocessed plant-based foods, and half of that is, half of this 12% here is potatoes from French fries. 63% is processed oils and sugars, and 25% animal-based. The Blue Zones, longest living cultures in the world, were 95% plant-based, 5% animal-based. So really, I you know, sometimes show this to them and say, you need to get rid of this yellow, increase the green and reduce the red. That's what we should be doing. This is what PCRM advocates, uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, drink water. Half, you know, almost half should be vegetables, whole grains, fruits, legumes. And, uh, but this is what the USDA says. They still have dairy on there. And so I actually, when, when people, you're talking to people in the public who aren't plant-based and don't really get it, oh, but the USDA dietary guidelines say milk's okay, low-fat milk. You say, you know what, look at the Canadian guidelines because they get it right. They don't have that conflict of interest. The USDA needs to tell you what's right to eat, but they also need to support agriculture. So they'd be killing the dairy industry if they said, don't drink milk. Canada doesn't have that conflict. Look at their food guide. Drink only water, half the plate is vegetables and fruits. Yeah, they say eat protein foods, but they show lots of beans and tofu and lentils and nuts on there. They still have animal products there, but they say straight out, plant protein should be the preferred protein. And so it's a way better step in the right direction. Now, of course, there's no need to eat animal-based foods at all, but at least Canada has got it more in the right direction, which is good. Nathan Pritikin is one of the founders of Lifestyle Medicine, had heart disease, was on 100% plant-based for a long time. And when he died, he said he wanted his autopsy published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is what I wrote. Now that's kind of gutsy, right? He wants everybody to know, does he still have heart disease after all he did? And the autopsy said there was a near absence of atherosclerosis and the complete absence of his effects like heart attacks or strokes was remarkable, showing how powerful that approach can be. And Esselstyn, Cleveland Clinic, one of the pioneers of this research, along with Dean Ornish, uh, really show that heart disease can be reversed. Now you can argue, how do you define reversal and go through lots of statistical mumbo jumbo, but the key is reducing heart attack, reducing stroke risk, making people live longer, not necessarily reducing the percentage of the blockage. Who cares about the percentage of blockage? You can see here in this picture here that this is wide open compared to what it used to be. And this is with diet only. You know what? The percentage doesn't matter. What matters is did the person have a heart attack, stroke, or did they live longer? Did, did they have some kind of major event? And research clearly shows that we can knock the risk of heart attack, stroke, and dying from cardiovascular disease to relatively close to zero by doing all the perfect things. And so that's, you know, a lot of that was Esselstyn data. And so um, the ACC AHA guidelines, I always like to be very evidence-based because again, there's a lot of skeptical people. I say, listen, do you know the primary prevention guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, they specifically say plant-based diets. Now, one of the reasons might be Dr. Kim Williams is, uh, is on that board and helped to write that, but it's all you know agreed upon by the whole panel, by the whole task force. 
the evidence and the science is clear. You don't shouldn't be listening to some random YouTuber about what to eat. You need to look at the big major medical authorities. And this is a great reference for people to, to go to and say, listen, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, they do recommend plant-based. And here's your guy, Kim Williams has been one of my big inspirations. And Chef AJ, you said his quote earlier that there's two types of cardiologists, vegans and those who have not read the data. I love that and that makes sense. But I love another quote that he said. What he said is, a whole food plant-based diet is a cure for heart disease. If you're a cardiologist and you don't tell your patient about the cure for their disease, that is medical malpractice because you are actively withholding a cure from them and you can't do that. That's wrong. And so that was another powerful statement that he said. And so um, it's, uh, it's the truth. And I just wish more people would get it and take their blinders off. And, and through your show, Chef AJ and, and other you know, people going out and talking, the message is getting out there, things like the game changers and forks over knives, but it's gonna require that whole cultural shift and um, we should never stop until we get there and hopefully it won't be too late. So that, that's kind of the end of my slide. So I'll, um, I'll stop sharing and- uh, wow. um, Oh yeah. my God, that I've never heard that quote from Dr. Williams, medical medicine, yeah. I love it. I mean, that is just amazing. He's amazing, wow. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, it is, you know, if you have a cure for something, I mean, for example, somebody had cancer and you said, you know what? I got this chemotherapy and we can have different talks about that, but I had this chemotherapy for this cancer and I know it has a you know 99% chance of curing the patient of their cancer, but you know what? I don't think they can do it. So I'm just not even gonna tell them about it. Uh, you can't do that. You got to tell the person about it. So, you know, when you have a person with heart disease, even if they've had a horrible diet and lifestyle, you, need, you say, ah, oh, this person's not going to change their diet. There's no way. Does that mean that you don't tell them about it? No, you still got to exactly. tell them Do you it. think, though, there are still doctors that don't know this information? But yeah, kind of. I do. Um, it was just two years ago. I remember I was at Rush uh, and um, there was a new cardiologist that was hired from outside. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, I, I'm a cardiologist. I focus on non-invasive cardiology, but I love lifestyle medicine, heart disease prevention and reversal. And they looked at me like, what's lifestyle medicine? I'm like, uh, what's lifestyle medicine? Well, you know, you ever hear of like Dean Ornish and, you know, plant-based diets and stuff like that. And they said, no, and it was just a couple of years ago. It was a fellow out of training on the East coast. So it is not in a lot of curriculums. People still have their blinders on. Now I trained, I finished my training in 2010. And I know for a fact I had no lectures in, in uh, nutrition and lifestyle medicine, never even heard the name Dean Ornish. So it, it is not really a part there. So I think that everybody has the concept where they know we should be eating healthy and exercising and it reduces risk. But I don't think people understand how profoundly it reduces the risk and how crazy important it is. Because a lot of the old school, car old school cardiologists still, you know, they preach heart disease is progressive. It's a part of aging, it's genetic. And, um, and uh, you know, we can maybe slow it down if you stop smoking and we control blood pressure with medicines and control cholesterol for medicines, but that's the wrong approach. That's clearly not what the science shows. It's caused by diet and lifestyle. The treatment should be diet and lifestyle. And that needs to be the main focus. Absolutely. You said something really interesting and I don't think I've ever heard it that way, but you're right. You said there's no money to be made on dead people unless you're selling them your, the coffin and there's no money to be made on healthy people. It's the sick people that generate all yeah money for the companies. And that's why, you know, we call it a healthcare system. The, the definition of the word health is the state of being free from illness and injury. In the lifestyle medicine world, we say, we don't wanna call it a healthcare system. We call it a disease care system because we're taking care of diseases. We're maintaining diseases. If we were a true healthcare system, we'd be trying to restore health, which is the state of being free from illness and injury. You go see your doctor about diabetes, you get diabetic medicines to control your sugar, but you're still diabetic forever. You get high blood pressure medicines to control your, your high blood pressure, but you still have high blood pressure forever. You're not treating the cause of the problem. A healthcare system should treat the cause and reverse diseases, but it doesn't, it maintains them. And that's the natural way it's developed just because that's how the reimbursement is. That's how we get paid. And, you know, you put people on medicines, they need to see the doctor, they need to get refills. It only lowers the risk by maybe 20 or 30%, depending on the scenario. So they still have their heart attack or their stroke. They still clog their arteries, need their stent or their bypass surgery. You just slow it down, but you never really cure it or, or reverse it. And so it's wrong. That is crazy. Would you mind answering a few questions from the people? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, thanks. The first one is from Deb. Where do I find a plant-based cardiologist? Ah, there's not enough of us out there. I mean, 
I know of maybe a dozen, maybe maybe 20 at most. So I think there's a bunch of different websites. There's plantbaseddocs.com. And I believe PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, if you go to pcrm.org, they have also a listing. And so you go to those two websites, plantbaseddocs.com uh, and Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and they'll have a map you put in your zip code. But there is also um, some telehealth uh, applications that can help with, you know, I, I see patients in California, um, but, uh, and I'm not licensed in the other states really, but there's, um, Dr. Lori Marbus is plant-based docs, I believe, and at least she's with your primary care and can do a lot of things with heart disease. But when it comes to complex heart disease, really, you do want to find a plant-based cardiologist. So I know some in New York and Florida, California, Michigan, Texas. Um, you just got to check out those websites. Right. And, and it's worth it because, uh, like you say, in plant-based telehealth, Lori Marbus, they're licensed in every state and Barnard Medical Center, every state or almost every state. The yeah. two healthcare doctors can. So there's lots of resources. Do you see people virtually or just in person in, I believe, Monterey is where you practice now? Yeah, yeah. I, I see both. I see both. Um, <clears throat> mostly is in person. But, you know, with COVID, we started doing all the, the telehealth stuff. But yeah, uh, both ways. Nice. Okay, so here is a question from Susan. My CT scan came back with main pulmonary artery is enlarged, measuring 3.4 centimeters. I've lost 95 with about the same to still lose on a whole food plant-based diet. What does this mean? Can it be reversed? Great question. And so unfortunately, a lot of different things like reversing atrial fibrillation and irregular heartbeat that's common and reversing some other disorders like you know pulmonary artery enlargement, what we call pulmonary hypertension, high pressure in the lungs. The data on that is extraordinarily weak. Really what the research focuses on for those things are the medicines used to treat those disorders uh, and the surgeries and the procedures used to treat those disorders, not the ramifications of lifestyle changes and weight loss. So the science in regards to having great data to answer a question like that, the science is very, very weak. We like to have what's called randomized controlled trials where we check thousands of patients and see some people lose weight, some people don't, whatever. But having said that, I do think it makes common sense from a medical perspective that it should be at least partially reversible. Each person's different. So when the pulmonary artery is big, it's usually from somebody who's obese and maybe had something called sleep apnea where people snore, snore, stop breathing, backs pressure on the pulmonary arteries. When you're obese too, it puts more pressure on the lungs on the right side of the heart. And that causes what's called pulmonary hypertension. So if you lose the weight and you no longer have the sleep apnea and your lungs get better and you breathe better, then the pressure should come down and you should at least not get worse with the pulmonary artery enlargement and hopefully get a little bit smaller if possible. So I hope that answers the question. Nice, thank you. You mentioned that your parents were in the 300s and your sister 400. Are they still at those weights or have they started doing what you do? I'm so proud of my family. I mean, it's, um, no, they've, they've done great. So uh, my sister, before, before I got into plant-based nutrition, she ended up getting a, a gastric bypass surgery, actually one called the duodenal switch. She lost 300 pounds and she's in the 150, 160 range, but she is on a nearly 100% plant-based diet now. She's uh, a big fan of a lot of the different uh, the McDougal program, actually. Uh, she, she knows you quite well, uh, Chef AJ, from all your videos. And uh, she's a fan of McDougal uh, and Garth Davis, too, the weight loss surgeon. <clears throat> and my mom and dad both lost more than 100 pounds and both reversed their diabetes. My dad, uh, it was a little bit after I went plant-based, he had a hip replacement surgery. And it went fine, but he hated surgery, hates doctors, like, like most people do. And after doing physical therapy, uh, his knee went out on him and his orthopedic surgeon says, now you need knee replacement surgery. And he's like, no way, I'm not doing it. He weighed 300 pounds, he had all these medicines. And I said, dad, you have two options. You can sit in a wheelchair for the rest of your life until you have your heart attack or stroke, or you can take control of your health, change your diet. And oh my gosh, I'm so proud of him. He went 100% plant-based with not a drop of oil, not a drop. And he loved it. And he cooked all these things and he did a great job reversed all of his chronic diseases, got down to something like 160 pounds and now walks three miles daily without any pain in his knee. That was like five or six years ago. And so he's off all his diabetic medicines, all his blood pressure medicines, it's amazing. So, and, and my mom, similarly, what happened with her is I bought her the book, How Not to Die by Michael Greger. And she's like, oh, my son doesn't want me to die. Isn't that so nice? He wants me to live a long time, how sweet. And she read it and was like blown away by it, 100% plant-based 
lost all uh, all that weight, got off her meds. She became very uh, passionate actually about animal rights as well, uh, which is great, you know, extra bonus. Uh, but she did she did uh, great with it. So we've we've been a big success. My wife is a family medicine doctor. She's been so awesome and supportive too. Six plant based kids are, are thriving. Oh, we've been so lucky. It's just, it's just amazing. amazing. You guys should have like a, like a reality show. <laughs> that would be a little chaotic. Loam at home. How about that? <laughs> loam, the loam at home. You mentioned your dad went on a no oil diet. Why is oil so controversial, Dr. Loam? When it doesn't make sense to me that if you feel like we're not supposed to eat processed food, if we're not designed, why oil has been touted as so health promoting, even plant-based doctors, even plant-based cardiologists now are saying, well, you know, it's not that bad, but I mean, it's 4,000 calories a pound. It has no, I don't, I don't get this. I mean, to me, that yeah. is like the, the most nonsensical thing in the world that people put oil in their mouth. So it's a, it's a very great thing to talk about with, with people. And I have a 17 minute YouTube video going through it all. And the way I went through the video is um, taking a common sense approach and taking a science-based approach. The common sense approach is the calorie density. It's highly processed. <clears throat> Oil has only been in the human diet for a couple thousand years, and we've evolved over tens of millions of years. So it just like you shouldn't squeeze all the orange, all the juice out of oranges to make orange juice. You shouldn't squeeze all the fat out of olives to make olive oil. It's highly processed. So that approach, and then the science approach, which is why some of the other doctors still advocate things like olive oil. Looking at the science, a vast majority of the data showing benefits for things like olive oil are what we call a substitutionary benefit. And what that means is they take out the animal fat and they substitute olive oil and people have less heart attacks and less strokes. And then people think, oh, olive oil must be good for me, right? Because they're, they're this, uh, these people are having less heart attacks and strokes. Well, is it really good for you or is it just less harmful than animal fat? The analogy I use for that is it's like, giving some people cyanide and giving some people arsenic, and then you follow them and see who dies. And the people on the cyanide die a lot quicker. And so you conclude arsenic must be good for you, right? Because the people on the arsenic, they didn't die that fast. And the people on the cyanide, they died real fast. So let's everybody eat some arsenic. No way, man, that's not right. Arsenic's still not good for you. It's less harmful than cyanide, but it's still bad for you. So it's the same thing with olive oil. It is less harmful than other sources of fat but it's still 15% saturated fat, calorie dense. So at the end of my long, to save you some time, at the end of my long 17 minute video, I conclude the only people that should be consuming oil is if your LDL is under 70, you're at your ideal body weight, you have no strong family history of heart disease, and you've had inflammatory marker blood tests, and you have no active inflammation because there's a lot of omega-6s in most oils, which are pro-inflammatory. So if you meet all those criteria, fine, have a little bit of olive oil, but that's like, less than 1% of the country, right? So right. like, but they're saying we need it for brain health and to prevent Alzheimer's now. I mean, like all this keto crap. And it's like, it's just, it drives me crazy. The keto thing is ridiculous. And that's another whole conversation, but you don't need oil for brain health. Again, humans only had oil in their diet for 2000 years. And we've evolved over tens of millions of years. And we need fats in the diet. Yeah. So I, I, I can see the controversy about when try, people are trying to restrict fat calories to 10% or 9%. We don't have enough data to say how good that is, but a lot of people do it and they do fine with it. Anecdotally, that's what the Ornish program was. That's what the Esselstyn program is. And they had at least five-year follow-up uh, with those patients and they did fine without any risk of dementia. And now Ornish is publishing data on reversing early stage Alzheimer's with this program, which again is gonna be a very low fat, whole food plant-based diet free of oil. And it's showing benefits to reverse early stage dementia. It's improving brain health. So once he publishes that, I think that's gonna kind of, you know, stop out any of those concerns. Well, that is gonna be amazing. A uh, question from Christina, how hard should you push yourself if you have CAD? I'm guessing maybe she means exercise wise. That's a great question. And um, there is a little bit of unknown, but in general for heart disease patients, they recommend 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days out of the week, aerobic type exercise, plus two days of strength training. Now that's the general recommendation. There is some data that says if you go more than that, if you do extreme stuff, marathon running, Ironman triathlons, things like that, it could actually increase the risk of cardiovascular disease significantly. But I wonder, I really wonder, when you look at people like Rich Roll, who did five Ironman triathlons in five days, and he eats whole food plant-based, if your LDL cholesterol is crazy low, and you're doing all the right things to prevent heart disease diet-wise and lifestyle-wise, maybe that extreme type of exercise 
would not necessarily be harmful for you. Who knows? The data on that is, is up in the air. So really the answer is you could push yourself pretty hard, 30 to 60 minutes a week, a, a day, five days out of the week, plus some resistance training. But if you're doing great and your LDL is under 70 and you don't have any inflammation actively in your system on inflammatory markers and you want to push it harder and further, go for it. I think it's fine. I've had people even run marathons after heart attacks. Not that it's really good, honestly, but I've had people do it and they've done okay. I had one person with severe coronary disease run the Chicago marathon four or five years in a row. So, I mean, people can do it, but is it good for you? Well, if you're in doing it in combination with really clean, healthy eating, your LDLs down, you're not having inflammation in your system, probably no, no limit on exercise. Wow. Great. Thanks. Listen to this. Beth says, my husband had a heart attack on May 17th, which happens to be Dr. McEagle's birthday. And the very <laughs> next morning, the hospital served him eggs and turkey sausage and lunch was turkey and dressing with gravy on top. You see, they're, they're smart. That's how they get customers. Well, so, you know, part of it is, I think it's a complicated, it's part of it's ignorance. You would hope to think that the administrators don't just say, oh, let's make our patients less healthy and feed them crappy food so they get sicker. And you hope they're not really thinking that. And I, don't, I like to think, oh, you know, you got to wonder the cigarette companies are thinking that. Oh, the cigarette companies are, you know, no question about it. But, you know, I, I do think a lot of it is ignorance. A lot of it is also they get paid based on patient satisfaction scores. And so if, somebody gets fed something that they don't like, their only option is oatmeal for breakfast and they want something else. And they, they nail the hospital and patient satisfaction scores, insurance companies pay them less. So they still wanna keep patient satisfaction crazy high. And part of it is, is the food. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a problem. And really, again, uh, California and New York have enacted laws, but it's not really enforced unless there's a local doctor that goes to administration and really pushes it. I've been successful with that. Thank goodness. Because once people look at it and listen to it and they hear it, I mean, you can't say no to it. That's the law. And that's what the science shows. You know, they tend, hospitals tend to make that change. So I would, um, I'd advocate anybody who's experienced something like that, try to go to plantbaseddocs.org, find a doctor associated with that hospital, show them the American Medical Association policy, the American College of Cardiology policy. Actually, PCRM has a whole guide, a PDF guide as to how to get hospitals to go more plant-based and they look at the different food vendors, Sodexo and all these other ones and say, these are the plant-based options that these food vendors uh, have for you. So if the hospital has this food vendor, you say, look, these are the things you should order. This is what the law shows. This is what the policy is. So go to your hospital people and, and push it and the changes should hopefully be made. Wouldn't that be great if we had like a hospital for healthy people, like a vegan hospital? Well, that's true north, I guess, right? <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. Hospital. It's, hospital, <laughs> but it's uh, close enough. <laughs> Can, is it possible to have cholesterol too low? Mine is at like, like 126 now, but I remember most of my life it was like 99. I've been vegan 44 years and people were like, oh, that's too low. And I'm like, too low for what? I mean, yeah, so it's controversial. Again, a lot of times uh, the science to answer these types of questions is pretty weak. And, and this is one of those areas where it's pretty weak. There was a couple of years ago, there was one published article that showed when people's LDL cholesterol is really low, like around 30, that there might be a little bit of a higher risk of bleeding in the brain. But honestly, there's so much of a lower risk of heart attack in the general stroke from cholesterol plaque buildup. Does that cancel out the risk of ble bleeding in the brain? You know, very likely it does. And so your body makes cholesterol for you. Again, it's not an essential nutrient. If you are eating whole food, plant-based, low fat, and your LDL is sitting at 60, you're fine. Now the controversy comes in if somebody's doing that and they take cholesterol medicines and drop their LDL to 20 or 10 or some crazy low number, okay, fine. Maybe that's not natural because not only are you lowering with your diet, but then you're pushing it even further with, with medication. So get on whole food, plant-based, keep it low fat where your LDL falls is likely what's completely fine for you. And some people do it and their LDL is still 100 or 120. I've asked, I've had patients come to me with that problem. I have not a drop of oil, no nuts, no seeds, no avocado, no coconut, no soy products. So very low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. My LDL is still 110 or 120. Esselstyn says it should be under 70 or at least under 80. Why is that? And you know, every person's different, but what Esselstyn says is, if you're doing the right things and you're on the right diet and you're not smoking, you're staying physically active, don't worry about your LDL number. You're protecting your endothelium so much. Neil Barnard, who has a lot of experience with this, what he says in his experience is the longer you stay on whole food, plant-based, no oil, slowly over time, that LDL will creep down. It might take 10 or 20 years. Remember, 
you are eating unhealthy for decades, you can't expect it all to reverse itself in a year or two. So the longer you maintain it, the lower that cholesterol number can go. I don't even want to get into nuts, that whole controversy. <laughs> because then I should be dropping dead from heart disease because I don't eat any nuts or seeds and I'm yeah. not dead. No, so that's good. How do you like that? Okay, uh, let's see. Thoughts on caffeine and the heart? Great question as well. Um, I love the question, Sarah. So yeah, caffeine and the heart, similarly, most of the data is epidemiologic, which has some weaknesses to that type of data where they just do surveys and see people, they haven't done a lot of randomized controlled trials where they say, you guys drink a bunch of coffee, you guys don't drink coffee and let's see who dies. So the, the, the data is a little challenging. In general, um, after analyzing things, it's not thought to be very harmful uh, to have coffee. It hasn't really been shown strong to increase heart attack and stroke risk. Uh, the most harmful thing about caffeine is the thing that comes with it, which is usually sugar and cream in people's coffee. When you look at, there's a couple studies that look at endothelial function and caffeine, which show impaired endothelial function. And that's why uh, Esselstyn's program, I went through his whole program. I drove out to Cleveland Clinic and sat through the whole day program with him. <clears throat> he, he wants to restrict um, caffeine, uh, not because the data has shown that it increases heart attack or stroke risk, but there's some basic science data that shows that it can impair endothelial function. And so, um, is that strong enough? I don't know, but you know, Dr. Esselstyn's experienced and he's a very wise guy. So I guess if you have severe advanced heart disease and you're really trying to reverse it, an aggressive approach, maybe ditching caffeine would make sense. But for the rest of the you know, general population, it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted. It, you know, maybe don't go crazy and, and drink, you know, five pots of coffee a day or something, but um, in general, it's not to be thought to be crazy harmful. Great, thank you. Monarch asks, where did that question go? If someone has high blood pressure over 160 and a leaky heart valve, can a whole food plant-based diet still reverse this? Another great question. So uh, blood pressure, most of the time, there are always some rare secondary causes of high blood pressure, the, uh, hormonal issues, um, kidney artery blockage from other things and such that might not necessarily be as easily reversed through diet and lifestyle changes. But the run of the mill high blood pressure, yes, indeed, can be reversed in a vast majority of cases. If you do all the right things, achieve ideal body weight, stay physically active, eat a predominantly or exclusively plant-based diet that's low in fat. And leaky heart valves, they leak more when the pressure's high. The heart pumps blood, that's what its job is with every single heartbeat, just pump blood. And if the pressure's high in the body in general, it has to pump extra hard to get blood out of the heart. And then that high pressure, will try to force blood back in the heart. So if the pressure is high out there, it'll actually make valves leak worse. So if a valve is permanently damaged by something, calcium buildup, or it was infected at one point, or somebody was born with a congenital valve condition that made it leak, it might not repair the actual damage on the heart valve, but at least by lowering the pressure, it takes the stress off of it and can delay the progression of the, of the heart valve condition. I've had people with severe, what's called aortic stenosis, blockage of the aortic valve, try to go 100% plant-based, no oil to try to prevent progression of it. And anecdotally, that hasn't worked because it's already too advanced at that point. But again, who knows? If you start it early, maybe you can prevent the valve from deteriorating and degenerating in the first place. There's just not a good enough data to really support that you know, scientifically, but it makes sense that it should help. Great, thanks. This question is actually submitted through email and it is from Melissa. Can you ask Dr. Loam if a low-fat plant-based diet can prevent spontaneous coronary, coronary artery dissection if caused a heart attack in someone I know? That's, a, that's another great question. So SCAD, SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection is being more and more recognized as a cause of heart attack, especially in younger people who don't have the traditional risk factors like smoking cigarettes, diabetes, high cholesterol and such. It's when the artery kind of spontaneously tears and when it spontaneously tears, it can cause chest pain, heart attack and all those things. The exact mechanism behind why that happens isn't very well validated or understood, but it's thought partially to be in many instances due to what we call connective tissue disorders. Um, and meaning like people are inherently born with weakening of the, the lining of the arteries. So with just like with everything else I've been saying, we really want to give answers that are science-based, evidence-based, and they haven't done randomized trials where they follow people on whole food plant-based and monitor for rates of spontaneous coronary artery dissections. 
So you can't give a solid answer as to whether or not it would truly help. But from a physiologic perspective, it makes tons of sense that if you knock out inflammation in your system by eating healthy, if you don't have endothelial dysfunction from eating the wrong foods, it's going to damage your uh, endothelium. If you don't have high pressure, which is going to put stress on your arteries, that is going to very likely reduce the rate of having spontaneous coronary artery dissections. A bigger artery called the aorta can tear and dissect. Uh, that is very well validated that controlling blood pressure and cholesterol, not smoking, protecting endothelium can prevent that type of dissection. So if you kind of say, oh, it's similar, it's a bigger artery, but it should technically be the same for coronary artery dissections. If you can make that extrapolation, then there's no question about it, that whole food plant-based no oil would be extraordinarily beneficial, beneficial to prevent it. So I, I would say the answer is very likely yes. I wish there was more data on it, but very likely yes. It certainly couldn't hurt, right? Oh, no question about it. And that's something I tell my patients all the time is when they have a weird disorder, a funky rash, a weird autoimmune disorder, some crazy cancer, I say, you have nothing to lose and only everything to gain by trying to go on a healthy plant-based diet and see what effect it has, right? It's the same Such for- Such a passionate people. advocate. I, are you, it sounds like you need to get certified in lifestyle medicine if you're not already, because you're just so passionate. You well, I am, board, I am board certified in lifestyle medicine. I was gonna say, because you remind yeah. me of my lifestyle medicine doctor, because the regular, when you go to, like when I go to doctors, I mean, they're very nice and very knowledgeable, but they've never asked me what I eat or anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's a phenomenal organization. It's really doing the right thing and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. More and more doctors are getting into it because they're getting burned out from the typical Western medicine and you know, prescribing pills and all the time. And, and so a lot of the physician Facebook groups, I see people saying, I'm burnt out, I'm burnt out. And you know what? I always comment and other people always comment, why do you think about lifestyle medicine? It'll give you a new passion, a new energy for taking care of patients in a different way. And a lot of people follow it and they, they go for it. That's great. Here's a comment. Six plant-based kids. This gives me hope for the future. Yeah. You know, it, um, it, it's very true. I tell when some people, you know, question and think about it, you say, well, again, the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics says hundred percent plant-based is nutritionally adequate for all stages of life. Dr. Spock, who was a famous pedi pediatrician who wrote a lot of books back in the day, his last book advocated hundred percent plant-based for kids, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, and it's, it's the truth that heart disease and all these, you know, insulin resistance leading to the risk of diabetes starts in childhood, habits start in childhood. And what adults need to realize is it's your job to make sure your kids are eating healthy, right? You choose as a parent what your kids eat. Cause a lot of parents are like, I can't get them to eat that or they're whining and cry. They want this. It's like, you know what? you choose for them. If you let them choose everything, they'd be playing video games all the time. They'd be eating lollipops 10 times a day and they would just be, you know, doing nothing. They wouldn't study. They wouldn't go to school. You, you tell them to do those things because you know, it's good for them. You got to do the same thing with food. Yeah. It's, yeah, I agree. Adina says, would you recommend aspirin therapy to someone who has not had a stroke or heart attack, but has evidence of plaque in the carotid artery under 50% and it is whole food plant-based, ideal weight and blood pressure. Yeah, so the, the science and the recommendations, again, going by the research and the guidelines from the major medical societies, they only recommend taking a baby aspirin if you've had an actual event, like a stroke or heart attack, an aneurysm, a clog in the legs, or if you're diabetic, because diabetics are high risk. Otherwise, aspirin for prevention is not really recommended because there is some risk of bleeding, bleeding ulcers and other things if you do take a baby aspirin. So just a small amount of plaque in the carotid arteries would not be enough to say you should take a baby aspirin. The same process that clogs the carotid arteries, clogs the coronary arteries, the aorta, the leg arteries. Um, so yeah, whole food plant-based, no oil can reverse carotid disease. And I've seen it anecdotally in a couple of my patients uh, where they've had you know, a certain amount of clogging and then we repeat the scan a year or two later and all of a sudden, because the inflammation's down, the scan no longer meets the criteria for being, you know, 50% clogged. It says it's less than 50%. So, uh, you know, I've seen it happen anecdotally. Again, like many things, there's not any good solid randomized controlled trials taking people with carotid blockage and changing their diets and waiting to see what happens, but we have it for heart disease. And it's the same process. So absolutely, that's the way to go if you're worried about carotid arteries and stroke. 
You know, one of my favorite scenes in Forks Over Knives was Dr. Terry Mason talking about the canary in the coal mine. Do you ever use that with your patients to suggest this might improve their life? No question. The canary in the coal mine. So he was talking about erectile dysfunction. So um, it is the first sign in men that their arteries are not very healthy. It is by, considered by many experts a risk equivalent for heart disease, meaning if somebody has erectile dysfunction, they have heart disease until proven otherwise. If you look at my YouTube channel, just search Stephen Lowe, my last video, which I hate to say it was more than a year ago. I really need to put more videos up there. It was all about this topic. Well, you can really put kind of, this video up there. I'll give you a copy. Hey, all right. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, and it was um, kind of featuring uh, the funny scene in the Game Changers where they fed different college, uh, college football players different foods and measure uh, their erections at nighttime. And it was, um, it was amazingly dramatic and really funny. So check that, check that one out. Yeah. Wow. That, anyway, you were just so passionate and so knowledgeable. I, I mean, I almost wish I had heart disease just so I <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. So how can people support you, follow you? What would you like? Oh, uh, no, I mean, so the, what I would really like, honestly, is mostly just for people to spread the word themselves. Because, you know, when I get to the end of my presentations to the community, I always tell people, you know, what can you do about it in order to make a big difference in the world? We have to be the change individually. Our money talks, don't buy the unhealthy products, you know, support other people in their healthy lifestyle journey. I really tell people that even if you are not a doctor or nurse or in the healthcare system, you can actually save people's lives. If you educate people about healthy diet and healthy lifestyle, you know, get them the book, How Not to Die, you know, uh, or, or whatever, lead by example. That's usually what I ask people to do. Um, I, I'm on, you know, social media like Twitter at Steve Loam and, and Facebook, Dr. Stephen Loam and such. I have a website, heartstrong.com, which is still kind of in, uh, in flux a little bit. But, um, you know, uh, I would just I would just say there's not, nothing needed to support me. Just support other people. That's the most important thing. Right. Well, people are asking you to please post more videos on your channel. <laughs> I know, I know. I really need to do that. I, I was my next one that I was thinking about, and I have it all outlined, is basically trying to scientifically address the topic. Is there any amount of animal-based food that you could eat that would technically be safe for your health? Is there any amount? Of course, you know, the answer, the answer is no, but you're going through the science behind it. So I'm hoping to put that one up at some point. Great. Well, you know, you can even edit this if you like and do the PowerPoint. And then if you want, just because that's well, that was really wonderful. So thank you yeah, so yeah. much. You're just really fun to talk to, easy to talk to. And I appreciate all you're doing to not only have plant-based kids, raising them and just in the plant-based space. So I'm glad to, very nice to know you. Yeah, thanks so much. And it's uh, great to be on your show. You've changed so many people's lives, yourselves personally. And I love what you're doing and getting that message out there. Keep going. Don't ever stop. Great. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 2 p.m. Pacific time when my guest is Dr. Cliff Morris, and he's going to be talking about emptying the pill bottle. You know what? You know, I should have asked you this, but the pills that they're, you know, the statins, people don't have a statin deficiency, right? I mean, That's right. I mean, and aren't there really severe risks with these statins? I mean, it gives you good numbers, but it doesn't address the cause. Yeah, so it doesn't address the cause. 50 million Americans are on statins and heart disease is still the number one cause of death. So clearly that's not the answer. It could, the data, the randomized controlled trials, which we have a lot of because companies make money off of drugs and so they fund the research and that's why there is science to support the statins. They do show re reduction in heart attack, stroke risk and death, um, but they're not a substitute for healthy eating. Number one, number two, there is always risk of side effects and, and things that can happen. Some are known like you know muscle related issues severe muscle issues that'll kill you. It is very unusual. It's like one in 10,000. I've seen it once or twice where people had near, you know, death experiences from muscle breakdown from statins, but it is unusual. And they always say the amount of life saved from statins, you know, balances out the risk, but come on, change your diet, you know, do it the right way. And then you don't need the statins. It's, there's no question. Even if the data shows that a statin can lower your risk by 30%, a lifestyle medicine approach can reduce it by almost a hundred percent. So take that approach. I mean, some people feel terrible when they're on them. And does, does it increase your risk for other diseases or is it diabetes that increases your risk for heart disease, not the other way around? Yeah, so it's been shown that it can increase blood sugars and can people who are on borderline criteria for diabetes can actually make them meet criteria saying now that they're diabetic. But the, the response to that is even if it does that, the data shows reduction in heart attack risk, stroke risk, and death risk. So even if you become diabetic from the medicines, you're having fewer heart attacks and strokes and dying. And so that's why it's not considered a good enough reason 
to not give statins. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of a weird thing. They can increase um, protein in the urine sometimes. There's questions about memory issues with it, but at the same time, it prevents strokes. So some of the nuances are complex and hard to answer, honestly. And that's why it's always the best thing to do is just do the right thing with your diet and you don't need the statin medications. At least, at least try it first, right? Yeah, you got it, you got it. So, so in other words, you want them to prevent, not stent. You got it, you got it, prevent, right. not stent, yep. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Long. It was so, no so enjoyable talking to you. It was Bye, a pleasure, thank you.